My name is Jane. I am a scientist studying snow. I dig a lot of big holes and collect snow to find out why it melts faster in some places than others. When people ask me why I study snow, I tell them I come from snow. I'm very proud of my snow beginnings. I was born in Ukraine, when Ukraine was a republic in the Soviet Union. Snow was a big part of life for six months of the year. It meant big fur coats and hats, building snowmen, snowball fights, snowflake dances, and ice skating every day. When I was 12, we left our fur coats behind, moved to the US, and ended up in Atlanta, where snow was something to overcome, a reason to cancel school and close roads. I could never shake my love of snow, though. So after college, I packed my bags and went to where I knew I could find it, the Rocky Mountains. Living in the mountains, I learned that snow wasn't just a source of fun. Here, snow means life. It means grass and flowers and water. It means people and cities and food. It means home. In school, I spent a lot of time thinking about and studying climate change. It didn't escape my notice that things were changing in my backyard that snow was melting earlier every year. Snowpack, this thing we consider a given in the West, is disappearing. Ski resorts are closing down. Reservoirs drying up. Wildfire seasons are getting worse. Trying to do something about a problem as big as climate change seemed really overwhelming. To me, all of these things seemed like symptoms of a bigger problem. I went on a mission to try to understand what was really going on with snowpack in the West. A friend of mine and fellow scientist Brian Schumann studies lakes. More importantly, the secrets of ancient climate that the lakes can reveal. The work up here is hard, long days. It can be an absolute challenge. But at the end of the day, we see something interesting. We've worked with our friends. We're out in a beautiful place. We were collecting mud from the bottom of the lake. Keep the, the tube down a whole meter. Uh -huh. and, and get a meter's worth. And get a meter's worth. Okay. Sounded easy enough. <laughs> get close to your mark. Ready? Set. Go. That's hard. Yeah, I think that was hard to pull it out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Going to such extremes to get a bunch of old dirt from the bottom of a lake might seem crazy. But this mud holds clues to some big questions about the future of snow. The tubes of mud that we've pulled up out of the ground here, there'll be 10,000 years worth of material that's piled up there. That mud is made up of all sorts of things. Sand and silt and clay, decayed algae, and dead fish, plant material from around the lakes. Those plants and animals trap some of the chemistry of that rain and snow and leave us a signal of it, leave us a record of what it was like. It's kind of like a time capsule. 
I remember as an elementary school kid, put a whole bunch of things from our class in a bucket. Yearbooks, newspapers, CDs. Hid it somewhere. 10 years, we could look at what we were like as elementary school kids. This lake is the time capsule of all this material from this environment here. And now we're going back to open that time capsule. One of the things we can learn is how sensitive is this landscape to change when it becomes a degree or two warmer, like we might anticipate in the near future. To get that record out of the mud, Brian picks up the samples and takes them back to his lab. Here, he slices and dices and analyzes like crazy. This all helps him start to form a picture of the past. The story goes a little something like this. Six to 8,000 years ago, when it was warmer, we see that the lakes were all much lower. It was much, much drier here. There were active dunes. That's when glaciers melted away, snowfields melted away. These natural reservoirs weren't spilling water down into the, the big creeks and the, the rivers that we depend on. Imagining this whole system that we have storing our water, that would be gone just from heating things up by one degree. It was gone. Based on where we're headed, we could fully expect that to be the future. It's not the end of the world. It just means it's the end of the world as we know it. This is our chance to learn lessons from that, have knowledge that will help us as we go through global changes again in the future. With visions of drying lakes and vanishing streams fresh in my mind, I wondered, were some of Brian's predictions already happening? I needed to go find someone who literally spends his days watching the snow melt. That man exists. His name is Billy Barr. I spell it small b-i-l-l-y, small b-a-r-r. -R. Some people call him the snow guardian. He lives in a cabin out in the woods. Picture this. It's a snowy day, it's dark and cold, and you make a fire and you're sitting by the fire and you're reading with a cup of tea and it goes on for nine months. Oh, hey. Hi. Billy lives alone in this house he helped build. Here, he grows his garden, has an impressive hat collection, loves cricket, and dreams of Bollywood. Every two weeks, he skis back into the nearest town for supplies. When I visited him, he had been doing this for more than 40 winters. But Billy does a little more than just read and drink tea. Oh, when were you born? 78. Oh, see, there you go. Was it in summer? No, it was in March. Let's history. see how much snow you had in March. Okay, I should okay, do this 1978, yeah. I can tell people, do you want to know how much snow I'll was predict in Belgium? I'll predict the kind of day it was for your birthday. It's March what? 24th. There we are. The low was minus 21 and a half Celsius. That's minus good. seven. That's good Russian cold. Seven and three quarter inches for the day. That's great. That's good powder day. We had 80 day. inches on the ground that day. The day you were born, there was 80 inches. Of snow. I remember that day because it was 80 inches. This wasn't just a party trick. For more than 40 years, Billy has kept a meticulous record of snow in his little part of the world. Okay, the market said February 26, 1978. Ten and a half inches of snow that day. January 20th, minus 11 and a half. April 28th, 1980. High was 41. Ooh, that sounds nice. 1997, one half inch new snow. A weasel was roaming around inside the shack. Damn, the birds were back. I lived in an eight by 10 foot old shack. I had no electricity, no water, and I had nothing, I and mean, I was just there all day. The main thing I interacted with was the weather and the animals. So I started recording things just because it was something to do. I had nothing to prove, no goals, no anything. So actually a researcher at the lab wanted to look at it. 
And then once he started looking at it scientifically, then all of a sudden, like, these decades worth of data were being used for more than my own curiosity. Yeah. It was good to see I wasn't the only person digging snow holes for a living. Billy has done this every day, twice a day, all winter long. I'd keep going until the snow was gone. If it snowed, I would record that no matter when. Um, I have so many more questions. I, 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 can, I can do tricks with my watches. Oh my God, how did he do that? Yes. Unbelievable. I know, it's incredible. The trend I see is that we're getting a permanent snowpack later and we get to bare ground sooner. We'll have years where there was a lot of snow on the ground and then we lost snow sooner than years that had a lot less snow just because it's a lot warmer now. In a normal winter, you'd expect four to five record high temperatures. Last year, Billy recorded 36. Not only is it a lot warmer, we're getting a lot of dust blowing in. As soon as you get dust on the snow, it melts like that. We get situations where looking for a flower that they pollinate and the flower's already bloomed and gone. Do you think, do you think ultimately things will be okay here? No. I mean, it won't be in my lifetime, but I honestly don't. It's just... I mean, you're talking about the, the, the snowpack, the water su supply for the, most of the Southwest. You know, I, I, and so I'm not real hopeful just because I don't know how you reverse something like that. Yeah, anyway. But I got, I got this trick I can do. Yeah, to see the trick things. Is good. Oh, no, it's really good. Solid gold. Oh, my God. As I left Billy's house, I asked him if he had any final words of advice. He said, You're gonna fall sit. A lot easier falling on your butt than on your face. Which, you know, is sort of like getting familiar with the weather. In a nutshell, this place is God. I mean, it really is. And uh, this place is a reflection of all of life. I would say drought is a part of life. I am worried about it. You have to plan on it happening. And so therefore I'm managing the way I am. In Big Piney, Wyoming, Freddie Botour runs about 4,500 head of cattle on 65,000 acres of Wyoming's prettiest sage country. His land is fed by snowmelt flowing down into the Green and Colorado Rivers. That water makes its way to millions of people in places like Phoenix, Las Vegas, and LA. Freddie has spent years looking for how to best take care of his land, regardless of how much snow he gets. Uh, this is impressive in its, how thorough it is and how much detail you've collected on your ranch. I am somebody who doesn't believe information when it's given to me unless I make questions about it. I'm trying to find answers to my questions on the ranch, whether or not my decisions and my operation are making a difference. Me just going out and looking at the ranch and being like, oh my God, I'm doing a good job here. This is just great, I'm so awesome. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work, that's just bullshit. My approach to keep myself from basing my decisions on emotion and what I want to believe is, is through monitoring. Monitoring and monitoring and more monitoring. Freddie has done everything from plant and soil surveys to restoring the wetlands on his property, all with the goal of raising cattle in a way that minimizes impact. A delicate balance between business and stewardship. In terms of grazing, Timing is everything. Part of time and timing is rest. 
the rest is more important than the grazing at this point. Freddie tells me he only runs cattle from spring to fall, moving the cows constantly so they only eat the tops of grasses. As they move, the herd tramples dead plants back into the soil. Yeah, so I'd compare it to having water spill on a table that didn't have anything on it to a table that was littered with sponges. It's a well-orchestrated dance that helps keep the land healthy and prevents the loss of water. I can't do anything about the storage of snow in the mountains. I can't do anything about the weather. The only thing that I can do is manage for the ground that I walk on and that my animals walk on. I'd like to think I've weathered better than some other operations. During those times of drought, I can still stock 4,500 head. Am I doing it? I think so, from the data. It's just nice to hear the sound of the water sometimes and the quiet out here. Yeah. So, I've been thinking one of the things about living on a ranch like this is having, like, being able to have a long view. You don't look for results very quickly. It's not just this stoic thing to say, oh, I'm the steward of the land, you know, this is my kingdom. It's a responsibility. It, there's no real choice in it for me. I celebrate the fact that I see good value and clean water and, and more wildlife and, and more abundance. When I started on this adventure, I wanted to learn what was happening to our snow. I don't think we can expect to make snowpack what it once was in the West. Things have changed too much for that. What we can do is learn from these changes and figure out how to do a better job. Time and adaptation, that is what we give ourselves. We can do this knowing that we're not alone in this struggle, regardless of creed or political leaning or whether we're good at skiing. Our love of snow is a common ground. The novelist Sir Walter Scott once said, we build statues out of snow, then weep to see them melt. Out here, we've built our lives around snow. We can either weep to see it go or do something about it. I know which one I choose. <laughs>